Good evening, fellow beekeepers, uh, and welcome to the first of two lectures by uh, Professor Adam Tafilski from uh, Poland. Um, just a little bit before um, I, um, I introduce uh, Adam, uh, as you probably all know, I'm a, I'm a beginner of good, um, a, uh, a bringer of good news. Um, today is the 20th of, uh, sorry, the 1st of uh, December, and uh, I'd like to remind you that in three weeks' time, the days will start getting longer, so you can start looking at all the sorts of things that you uh, would like to be doing with your bees uh, during the uh, summer. Um, we've just uh, announced uh, that we've got in the new year over 40 uh, webinars for, um, uh, for teaching beekeeping. They're in five different groups, uh, one for prospective beekeepers so that um, local beekeeping associations have had inquiries from people to start beekeeping. Uh, we can now do a, a national uh, event uh, for that. In fact, we're going to do two national events. Um, the other one, the next one, which um, we determine uh, I've just started or about to, uh, I, I have a lot to learn. It's really for the, the people who have <laughs> obviously only just uh, started beekeeping. Uh, sound foundations in beekeeping, which will be obviously beginners up to perhaps about five years beekeeping, something like that. Uh, intermediate and advanced, and then one on bee improvement, which um, uh, we try to concentrate on uh, during the uh, 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 during the winter. Um, they will be circulated soon, as I've uh, mentioned. Please, please, please publicise them to other beekeepers and your local uh, beekeeping associations if you possibly can. Um, now, I guess that if you're on the NBU list, you've probably had a warning in the last uh, couple of days uh, about feeding bees. Well, quite honestly, folks, um, if you've got bees that um, suit the environment, uh, you probably don't have to. So uh, that could be a little bit of a clue. If perhaps you've got bees that you fed well um, a couple of months ago, and they are now getting short of food, then perhaps they're not the sort of bees that are most suited to our environment. So uh, rather than let them die um, uh, or starve out, just uh, keep feeding them and perhaps uh, mark them down for requeening uh, early in the spring. Um, those of you who know of the um, uh, the book, The Honeybees of British Isles by B. Wolf Cooper, will know that it's um, been out of print for several years. Um, I can now announce that uh, uh, today, in fact, um, it has been brought back into print. So if you would like a copy, they will be available uh, fairly soon. Uh, there will be others that will uh, follow it uh, too. Uh, and there are uh, several new ones in the pipeline uh, uh, as, as well. Now, this evening's speaker is Adam Tafilski from uh, Poland. Adam did spend, I think, three years in, uh, in Sheffield, um, 10, 12 years ago, something, something like that. So you'll probably find his English is, uh, is a little bit better than mine. Um, he's going to speak to us um, with the title of How to Protect uh, Native Honeybees. Now, don't forget that probably the native or the bees that are native to uh, Adam in Poland are probably the same ones genetically as ours. They might, yes, they might have different uh, variations, but right across the, um, uh, the north of Europe, they are uh, effectively... Uh, the same. Um, Adam has been involved um, uh, for many years with uh, native bees and there's probably nobody uh, uh, more authoritative, authoritative than him. Uh, he has uh, prepared a video, sorry, a, um, uh, a recording for us which includes videos and uh, that is what he's going to play but with the questions and answers. Uh, they will be live. You can see uh, Adam, or I can see Adam anyway, um, uh, 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 smiling at me. <laughs> Why, I don't know, but he is. Um, he will be answering questions live. So if you've got any questions, please type them in the, uh, the Q&A and we'll try and get as many answered as we possibly can. So can I please introduce Adam Tafilski. Adam, welcome. Good evening, Roger. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I will try to 
encourage you to uh, protect uh, local bees. I hope you see the, my presentation. So uh, you probably know that uh, in nature, bees uh, live without beekeepers uh, in uh, hollow trees. They reproduce by swarming and uh, they don't need any human help. And uh, before beekeeping, the distribution of honeybee was in uh, Europe, except northern part, in Middle East, in Africa, as you can see. Uh, but later, people distributed the honeybee all over the world. So nowadays, the bees are in Asia, Australia, America. But the original natural distribution was, as you can see here, and within this uh, large distribution, mm, there are different uh, uh, climates and there are different conditions. And um, there are recognized about 20 subspecies. What's the difference between species and subspecies? So species cannot breed uh, with other species. So for example, Apis mellifera is one species and Apis serana another and they don't produce hybrids. But um, in Europe, bees from Europe can interbreed with bees from Africa and they can produce hybrids. So subspecies is when they can hybridize. And uh, different subspecies differ in uh, um, morphology, behavior, and um, the differences uh, can be um, in different body parts. However, usually they are small and in order to discriminate subspecies, usually it is required to make measurements and it's not so easy, but um, also not very difficult. I will talk about this next week. And uh, the different subspecies also differ in behavior. Uh, for example, um, the subspecies can differ in amount of brood and if they have a brood in winter or not. And the bees in Northern Europe can have break during winter, whereas bees from Italy or Africa, they can produce brood all over the year. So there are other differences in behavior. Some of them will be interesting to beekeepers, for example, at which time lime workers uh, start to appear in queenless colonies. And for example, here in Europe, it takes three to four weeks before line workers will be present. But in Africa, it can be only one week. So we, if you use uh, bees imported from Africa, you can uh, have problem with line workers earlier. There can be also problems with robbing. So the differences in behavior are more difficult to measure, to compare, because they depend on weather conditions, time of year, and so on. So then, uh, why the subspecies are present? This is because of natural selection. So bees living in different climates, different weather, adopt to these conditions, because those colonies which don't uh, survive are eliminated, and those which thrive, produce um, swarms, they uh, survive to the next generation. So um, this is important to understand that subspecies native to a particular area should survive better. And there are um, good scientific evidence that local bees are good at survival. They survive. So that's why they should um, be preferred to beekeepers. I would like also to introduce some terminology, including evolutionary lineages, because similar um, subspecies can be grouped in larger um, groups, and they are called lineages. And in Europe, there is lineage M, C, O, and A. And I will show this on uh, another picture. So here, there is a um, natural distribution of honeybee in Europe. You see that in the north, in Finland and northern Norway, there, it was too cold for honeybee. So uh, 
Naturally, honeybees never lived there. Nowadays, uh, beekeepers can help bees to survive winter and now they also are kept there. Apart from this, you see white uh, spots. Those are not clouds, but mountains because um, like large water bodies, mountains are barriers for distribution of bees. And they are um, important places where uh, there will be borders between different uh, lineages and subspecies. Here we can see the lineages uh, which are in Europe. You see that in Western and Northern Europe, there's lineage M. In uh, uh, Southern and Eastern, there is lineage C. In Turkey and the Middle East, O. And in, here in Africa, but also in all other parts of Africa, there's lineage A which is also in Sicily and Maltese islands. Mm. We are more interested in the Northern Europe and you can see that in lineage M there is Iberiensis uh, and Melifera. The border between them are mountains. So uh, in Melifera is from lineage M, so there is only one other subspecies, which means that it's quite different from other subspecies. The neighbors of Melifera mellifera, which is also called dark bee, is Iberiensis, Ligustica, Carnica, and Carpatica. And as you see, the area of Melifera mellifera is quite large and includes both Ireland, Great Britain, but Poland and uh, large part of Russia. And uh, within this large area, there are different climates and uh, winters in Russia are much more colder than in Great Britain. So that's why even within subspecies, subspecies there are um, uh, recognized ecotypes. And uh, they also differ in, to some degree in morphology and behavior, but uh, it's uh, usually they are not recognized, but uh, native bees in Scotland should be different than in England and even different than in Poland. It's also important to understand that when you lose bees in Great Britain, it's, it's, it will be not so easy to replace them. Even if you take them from Poland or from Russia, they will be from the same subspecies, but this will be the other ecotype. So it's important that um, British beekeepers should um, protect their native uh, ecotypes. I also would like to introduce uh, breeding lines. So in, uh, it is important to distinguish uh, lineages, subspecies and ecotypes which are natural from breeding lines, lines which are artificial. So beekeepers choose groups of colonies and they select them artificially for some traits. Usually this is like honey production, but uh, can be also hygienic behavior. But usually beekeepers mm, look for honey production. That's why the honey production is more important than survival. Um, and usually the breeding lines are uh, maintained by artificial insemination, but also they can be kept in some isolated uh, places like small islands. One of the breeding uh, line is backfast bees. It's not so easy to, to say what is backfast and what's not backfast because there is not one breeder, but uh, different breeders call the bees backfast. But uh, in general, we can assume that they produce large colonies, which uh, produce lots of brood and the brood is usually present in winter. So they need more food and sometimes when during summer there is um, time of um, not so good weather, beekeepers need to feed them. And uh, there, is, there are information that those bees are more inclined to robbing. Uh, so native dark bees are also robbing, but not as much as um, backfast bees, at least it's believed. So the problem with the um, subspecies uh, is that um, beekeepers import a lot of queens which are not native 
and they import from all over the world and sometimes they import hybrids and um, the beekeepers believe that the um, uh, other bees are better than native uh, however it's um, usually quite difficult to determine this and even if there is some publication that some breeding line is better in Germany it doesn't mean that it's also good in Scotland because you have different climate. So I think that usually there is assumption that the, some breeding lines, some other bees are better, but usually it's not very well supported. But uh, on the other hand, some beekeepers prefer those. So I'm sure there are some properties uh, which are good. So what are the consequences of the import? First, there is hybridization with the local bees. If there is lots of import, the local bees can be replaced completely. And there is problem with parasites and uh, pathogens. Um, so the problem with hybridization is related to the lack of control of uh, mating of honeybees. So it's, bees are not uh, like um, domesticated animals, not like chicken that every farmer has his own chicken and controls their mating. Um, honeybees can interbreed with uh, colonies of other beekeeper and also can interbreed with feral wild colonies. So it's, um, uh, it should not be called domesticated because we don't control it. And uh, you probably know that the mating is during flight, that the queens and drones travel quite a long distance. So drones usually one kilometer, um, queens uh, usually about two kilometers, but there are some information that some drones can travel even seven kilometers. So when one beekeeper will introduce some imported non-native bees, he will affect other beekeepers even if his neighbor or her neighbor would like to protect the native bees. So when uh, the imported bees are introduced, they uh, replace the uh, local genes and the biodiversity is lost. So as I mentioned, the Scotland, bees in Scotland can be different than bees in England and different than bees in Poland. So in Scotland, there are some unique genes. And if we uh, lose those genes, this will be um, irreversible if, because the, the evolution was during like thousands of years and uh, it will be not so easy to replace the genes. So it would be the easiest to ban the import. And um, the problem is that uh, in European Union, there is like free movement of goods. And according to this rule, you can buy any material from any country in Europe. Uh, so the problem is that honeybee is uh, treated like a commodity, which I think is a misunderstanding. So, um, don't understand me wrong. I like uh, European Union. I think there is many advantages, but in case of this uh, free movement of goods and treating bees like a commodity is not good and um, makes it difficult to protect native bees. Anyway, it's like controversial issue and probably some beekeepers would uh, like to continue import. So we will not uh, deal with this, but let's see what we can do if some beekeepers want to protect native bees, what they can do. So the simple, simple thing is just to stop buying any queens and colonies. So occasionally you can uh, decide that your bees are uh, very defensive or um, there are too much diseases. So if you decide to replace, you should find a local breeder and then obtain the bees from him. But uh, uh, also it's possible, but it's more difficult just to recognize the non-native bees and requeen them. But this uh, requires more effort and usually you need 
measure the bees and about the morphometry, I will talk um, next week. Some beekeepers uh, can think that such a protection of native bees does not make sense. They claim that it's too late, that the damage was done, biodiversity was lost, and uh, even if I will try to protect bees, my neighbor will import and he will spoil my effort. So I will try to convince you that this uh, protection makes sense. So first of all, uh, uh, it's important that in um, uh, Ireland and Great Britain, there are still uh, Apis mellifera mellifera, dark bees, native bees. The situation is better in Ireland and Scotland, uh, where the um, native bees are more pure. In Wales, in England, it's not so good because um, there are lots of hybridized colonies. Um, so uh, there is problem. And we know that lots of um, non-native genes was introduced. But still, even in Wales and in England, there are a large proportion of native genes which deserve to be um, protected. So uh, I'm also not very strict about this, that um, you should protect real British bees. And um, I think that's what more important is protect local bees. And um, the, why it's important? Because they survive better. In recent times, there is more and more problem with uh, colony losses and CCD and this kind of problems. And I think that uh, it's uh, partly related to importation of non-native bees, which, um, which don't survive as good as native bees. Uh, so if you, even if your bees in your area are already hybridized, you should use those bees because they survived at least few winters. So there is chance that they will survive the next. If you import new bees from abroad, it's possible that their survival will be not so good. And also um, the protection of nat native bees does not mean that you cannot um, improve them. So I think beekeepers should uh, make some artificial selection to make the bees uh, more manageable, uh, less defensive. But for this selection, they should use the native genes. So beekeepers from Scotland, they should improve their bees and beekeepers from Wales, theirs. So I think this should be done without uh, import. So one of the, the phenomenon which will ha help in the conservation is partial reproductive isolation. And we have studied this in Poland. In uh, most part of Poland, Apis mellifera mellifera is native, which is the same subspecies as in Great Britain. And um, we have in Poland also problem with this hybridization. But in northern part of Poland, there is still quite a lot of these native genes. Um, but uh, we know from our earlier research that uh, there is uh, both uh, Carnica genes and Mellifera genes. And we have introduced there uninseminated Mellifera and Carnica queens, and we have checked uh, their offspring. And we have found that offspring of Mellifera queens were fathered more often by Mellifera drones. And this difference was not um, so clear in uh, Carnica queens. So this shows that uh, Mellifera queens usually more often mate with um, um, Mellifera drones. On this graph, you see the illustration. And on the vertical axis, there is a similarity to Apis Mellifera Mellifera. And in the upper part, it's more similar to Mellifera, on in the bottom more similar to Carnica. And this uh, part illustrates the uh, workers in nearby apiaries on the right. And we see that there is uh, in the 
apiaries surrounding our research station, there was a wide range of hybrids, both Mellifera and Carnica. And uh, second from the right, it's uh, drones which inseminated the Mellifera queens. And you see that they are high up, which means that they are more Mellifera, but there are some um, similar to Carnica. In case of um, drones inseminating Carnica queens, which is second from the left, they are wide range uh, and they are not different from surrounding apiaries. So it seems that uh, in the same area, native and non-native bees can coexist and segregate to some degree. This segregation is not perfect, but uh, this should help to protect bees. Exact mechanism is not known. So we don't know if the queens, Mellifera queens uh, made at different times of day or at different places. So I assume here, although we don't have this knowledge that uh, Mellifera queens prefer Carnica drones. And um, I think that the mechanism which explains this is that uh, the Carnica bees don't survive very well in North Poland because the climate does not suit them. And when the Carnica um, queens or non-native queens don't survive very well, there is a natural selection for queens to avoid non-native drones. And in this way, those queens which uh, mate with native drones uh, survive better. So there is no, um, so this is kind of my interpretation of the uh, situation. So this um, partial reproductive isolation uh, was also observed in other places by other researchers. And I think that it should be present also in Great Britain. Uh, and uh, this mechanism will help to uh, protect the native bees, even if some of beekeepers will continue to import non-native bees. And I advise uh, you to not buy queens, to use your own, but, this, uh, but I don't mean that you should not requeen. Requeening is a good practice. You should requeen, but you should use your own queens or use uh, swarm queen cells or emergency queen cells. Um, Roger already explained this in another webinar, so I don't have time to talk how to do this. It should be quite clear. So, uh, and some of you can worry that your queens will be not as good. So maybe in uh, terms of genetics, uh, which is, you know, problematic, uh, but in case of like size and health, uh, I'm quite sure that your queens obtained from swarm queen cells or emergency queen cells, they will be better. So what, what are the problems? So I will try to mention some problems with the commercially available queens to try to discourage you from buying them. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure if you know that the uh, commercially available queens, they are uh, produced as emergency queens in queenless colonies. And uh, to one uh, colony, they introduce many queen cells, more, sometimes more than 40, and one batch after another. So this is um, not very natural. In nature, number of queen cells usually is smaller. So um, the quality of the queens can be not as good because they can be not fed properly, not as good as uh, your queen. And there is also a problem with parasites and uh, some of the queens uh, can be injured, which I will try to explain. So uh, in order to determine the quality of queens, it's good to have some minimum standards. I don't know if you have, if you, if you have such standards in uh, UK, but in Poland, there was such a minimum standard. Unfortunately, at some point it was uh, abandoned. But so for Carnica, we have like minimum body mass and minimum um, foreign wing length. And uh, for Mellifera, mm, 
queens. This is uh, uh, a little bit different because uh, in general, uh, dark bees are bigger, so the minimum standard is also bigger. Uh, so it's not so easy for beekeeper to uh, weigh queens, but it's easier to determine the following length. So uh, I, about this um, morphometry, I will talk next uh, week. So if you are interested, you can just um, uh, measure the wings. It's not uh, easy in a live queen, but for example, if some of your queens are uh, not accepted to colony, you can find that queen in, in front of the hive, and then you can remove the wing and measure. Or when you requeen queens, you can check what's the quality of the queen which was used by you. Commercial queens also can have more problems with injuries. Uh, in mass production, some breeders store uh, young, uninseminated queens in colonies. And in this situation, workers uh, are quite aggressive towards them and they can cause the injuries. And most often there are injured antennae and legs and in legs arolia, uh, which is like a soft part of the, at the end of the leg. And um, if you like, you can try to detect such injuries if you place a queen in a transparent box, uh, the best is to use sterile microscope where you can observe if the queen is walking properly and if um, all the body parts are present. Even more important problem than injuries uh, is uh, a parasite. So it's well known that Barra destructor, Nozema serrane, uh, were introduced by beekeepers from Asia and a small hive beetle was introduced from Africa. So normally uh, they were not present in Europe. So this is because of beekeepers activity and um, there, there was probably sp spread of viruses, but they are not so easy to detect. So much, not a lot of information there is about um, presence of new viruses. So, uh, and there are data that uh, Honey bee queens produced by breeders are not always healthy. And for example, there is one study from Poland where uh, queens obtained from queen breeders, 7% of queens and more than 8% of attending workers were infected with nozema spores. And uh, almost 15% of queens were injured. So in total, like more than 20% of queens were of not good quality. And so you can think that maybe in UK, the situation is better, but I'm afraid probably it's not so good because uh, it's not so easy to fight with Nozima when antibiotics are not allowed. Um, so uh, I think that uh, in UK, there can be similar problem. And I think the problem is um, important because if you have a queen infected with Nozima, she will infect workers because queens, when after uh, mating flights, when queen starts laying eggs, she's not flying. So the queen is defecating inside the hive and uh, with the feces, the queen is releasing the spores and she's infecting the workers. So if you have such a queen, you will be not able to cure the colony. You need to requeen. Uh, so you can also verify this. It's uh, not so easy in live queen, but as um, I mentioned before, if one of your queens was not accepted by colony and you find that queen in front of, in front of the hive entrance, you can uh, try to look for nozema spores. If you have microscope, if not, you can ask somebody else. But if you check this, I'm sure you will also find that some of queens available in UK are infected. Uh, another research was done in United States. And uh, in United States, there was no nozema in the queens distributed commercially. But this is because at this time, 
in the United States, it was allowed to use antibiotics. And uh, it is well known that in the United States, the beekeepers use a lot of antibiotics, so they were able to prevent infection with Nozema. However, the, um, a large proportion of queens was infected with viruses, which is uh, not difficult to detect by beekeepers. Um, especially one of the viruses uh, here in the middle, the form wing virus was present in most of the queens. Only one was free of this virus. Some other virus were present in different queens. So this is not really good news because it means that when you buy queens together with them, you can buy some parasites. And uh, nowadays in mm, times of COVID, we understand this isolation. So I think when you use your own queens, when you don't borrow any equipment from your mm, other beekeepers, when you don't buy queens, don't buy colonies, you, your colonies should be healthy. And uh, I mentioned already robbing. Obviously, native bees also rob when uh, provoked, but um, the imported bees can be more prone to do this. And uh, I think to, I, I will try to convince you that uh, some of the expectation about quality of the purchase queen can be uh, exaggerated. And uh, in, fact, in fact, I think that if you have decent bees, if they are surviving and if they are producing honey and they are not very defensive uh, and healthy, you should stick to them because um, buying new queens is um, associated with some risk. For protection of local bees, uh, there are also important feral colonies, which is wild colonies living in uh, uh, hollow trees and uh, they survive without beekeepers and uh, uh, they tolerate varroa. So um, we know that uh, if uh, here in Europe we don't treat, the colonies will not survive. But in Africa, in uh, Americas, there are big population of feral bees. They, are, they have varroa and all other diseases. And despite this, they survive and uh, what is paradox in United States, there are uh, problems with managed population. There are big losses and population is declining. And at the same time that Africanized bees from the South is spreading in United States, despite the fact that this is kind of um, limit of their uh, climatic suitability. So, I think that there is some problem either with the bees uh, or beekeepers in United States that uh, feral colonies uh, don't have those problems uh, which are suffered by managed colonies. And uh, uh, there is opinion that the number of feral colonies is uh, small or absent or neg negligible. And um, uh, they are still present in, I think, in both in Poland and in uh, Great Britain. And we tried to um, verify this and uh, uh, we inspected more than 100 kilometers of trees along the road and we found there 45 nests. So more than 1% of hollow trees uh, was occupied. So it's um, not so rare. If there, is, uh, if there are suitable places for nests, the feral colonies will also uh, be present. And uh, uh, we also try to estimate how long the feral colonies live. And uh, in some cases, we have observed the same uh, bees for like surviving for three years. But also we know that the mortality is high. Uh, so usually after some time, the, the nest site is empty, but at the same time, it's often recolonized. So after one year or two, the same hollow tree is uh, occupied by another colony. Unfortunately, it's not clear if the bees occupying the hollow trees are from feral population or they are uh, from, uh, they are swarms which escaped 
from managed colonies uh, used by beekeepers. So this is important because we, we are not sure if the feral colonies produce enough swarms to uh, compensate the, the high mortality which they uh, suffer. So for the protection of feral colonies and which is at the same time protection of feral uh, of local bees because feral colonies by definition are of local origin, uh, you should uh, protect the colonies and their nesting sites. Some beekeepers um, remove the feral colonies which is usually quite difficult. Uh, so it would be better to not remove them, to protect the feral colonies, and also to protect all trees. There is not a lot of tall trees, and there is problem that uh, some of them are removed because there is problem with safety. So here you can see in, in this picture tree uh, from which uh, branches were removed. And uh, in such a tree, that tree, uh, there is uh, still place for honeybee colonies, but also for birds, uh, for beetles and some solitary bees. So um, such a um, large old, sometimes even dead trees uh, are good for nature and good for uh, feral colonies. Unfortunately, the number of uh, such big trees is uh, small. So um, I think that it's a good idea to provide artificial uh, nesting sites. It's similar uh, to providing nest boxes for birds. Uh, you can make like a large wooden box. Volume should be around uh, 40 liters, uh, but the walls should be at least five uh, centimeters and you can put such a box. And I think that uh, honeybees deserve more protection than great tits than other birds. Uh, if you don't like um, nesting bee boxes, you can also provide empty hives. Uh, however, in case of empty hives, they, they should not be placed um, together with managed hives in the appear. They should be isolated just one empty hive at any one place and they should be left unmanaged. It's important to keep it uh, uh, isolated from managed colonies because in managed colonies there are varroa mites which are quite virulent. I believe that um, this tolerance of varroa in feral populations is related not so much to resistance of bees but I think that varroa mites are not so uh, virulent. It means that uh, it's not in interest of varroa to kill the honeybee colony. Uh, but when beekeepers use pesticides, you know, this does not work. So uh, there is no time to explain this, but um, I believe that beekeepers should uh, protect the um, feral colonies and provide um, sites for them. The, the empty bee boxes or hives, yeah, can be empty because this is natural situation. And if they are colonized, you should observe quite high mortality. You should not be discouraged by this. It's quite normal. So you probably know this, uh, but uh, honeybees are very important for uh, pollination of both wild and cultivated plants. And that's why their, their uh, value is high uh, from both ecological and economical point of view. And this is uh, more important than, than just honey produced by, by the bees. So I'm trying to convince you that uh, by protecting the native bees, which will survive better, you should make the population more stable. And uh, in this way, uh, it will serve better for both nature and agriculture. And uh, uh, in this sense, I um, was uh, surprised that most beekeepers in the uh, United Kingdom 
have relatively small number of colonies and only 1% of uh, beekeepers are professional. It means that most of the uh, non-native queens are imported by hobby beekeepers. It means that um, it's not a, like economical problem because I would um, understand the import may be easier if a beekeeper is like uh, trying to uh, feed his family, to pay mortgage, you know, to survive. But in case of um, hobby beekeepers, it's, uh, there is not such a problem. So the cost of changing habits is um, not so large. And uh, in this context, I, I have impression that many beekeepers uh, import colonies, make them large, very strong, and travel with them to collect as much honey as possible. And I think there is alternative of using native bees. Allow those bees to grow slower at their pace and uh, possibly they will make, uh, they will produce less honey, but it will be of good quality because you will not need to feed the colonies uh, during uh, summer. And the beekeeper, beekeeper should have less work and fewer problems with uh, their survival. So if you can, can you afford it and you, are, you dare to go against the mainstream, you can adopt this slow uh, beekeeping um, tool. And I believe then uh, in this case, quality of your life will be higher. I think that um, the time uh, is over. So I would like to thank you for your attention. And if there, is, if there are any questions, um, I will try to answer them. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. Um, a brilliant lecture. In fact, um, uh, some of it is what we've already heard, but it's great to hear it from a, uh, from a scientific angle as well. Uh, <coughs> we've got several questions come in uh, so far, which I'll start with. Um, I'll try and go down the list. Uh, winter is now quite different from 30 years ago. Is winter brew production related to the day length or temperature? Uh, so, <coughs> as I understand, uh, if the climate change is affecting bees, so it's not so easy to answer this, but I, uh, I think that um, from my observation, the native bees, at least in, in Poland, for example, they consume, I have one colony on a, a balance, which is weighed continuously, so they consume very little um, food. And, I, and in Poland, the climate should also change. So I think that uh, native bees Long, long time ago and nowadays they should not have brood during winter but the imported subspecies they would tend to to produce brood during winter yeah. um i know this is your lecture but um i've kept bees now 57 years and um i've never really noticed any difference in the um in the brood production during the during the winter so i think probably uh the bees know the bees know what's happening um, next question, uh, is there any evidence that Apis mellifera mellifera has any greater resistance to Varroa mites than other subspecies, or is it a question of selecting for hygienic behaviour traits within the local gene pool? So the, the problem is that it's unlikely that uh, mellifera mellifera is more resistant to Varroa mites because uh, Baroa is not native to Europe. So uh, like <laughs> 50 years ago, there was no Varroa. So there was no um, long time of coexistence between Varroa and uh, uh, Mellifera Mellifera. So that's why it's unlikely. And when the Varroa was introduced, then beekeepers treated uh, colonies against Varroa. And again, there was no opportunity for um, such uh, resistance to evolve. So such resistance, if exists, 
it will exist only in the feral population which is not treated because if beekeepers treat not only they do not allow to mellifera merifera to become resistant but also there is selection for varroa to be more virulent because when you kill 99 percent the varroa tries to reproduce as much as possible if you are not treating Varroa will kill the colony, and it's not good for Varroa. So Varroa uh, in, should reproduce, but should allow to produce swarms to reproduce with the swarms. So I don't think that uh, Malif there are any evidence that Mellifera is more resistant than other subspecies, but uh, other subspecies became resistant when there was no treatment. So I believe that such a resistance can evolve, but only when there will be no treatment, which is unlikely in managed colonies, but this will happen in feral colonies if the, the population is large. Thank you. Is it likely with the um, extra brood in the, um, uh, in the imported queen, um, uh, colonies from imported queens, is that going to increase the varroa level within the colony, especially if you get um, a brood rearing throughout the winter? So um, varroa mites, as you know, reproduce <laughs> in the brood and the cupping. So the more brood, the more varroa. So uh, mm, uh, I would expect that in colonies with big amount of brood, there should be more varroa. <laughs> So, and it's well known if there is break. So this break can be during winter. This break can be also during summer. And some people encourage beekeepers, beekeepers to make such a brood in a break in brood cycle. Uh, so in a backfast bees or other hybrids which produce lots of brood, there will, I think I would expect uh, more need for pesticide use to, to fight varroa or to other methods. Well, this one's interesting. Uh, you mentioned that um, uh, mellifera queens tend to mate with mellifera drones if they possibly can. Questions come in. Do mellifera and carnica drones and queens fly at the same altitude in drone assemblies or do they fly at different levels? So we have only tested uh, uh, the genes, you know, the offspring. So we know uh, the <laughs> offspring uh, was fathered by Mellifera, but we don't know the mechanism. So unfortunately, I don't know. So there are some other research which were made between Carnica, I think, and Ligustica, and there was some suggestion about time of day. But I, I unfortunately, we have not studied drone congregation area, so we don't know uh, <clears throat> anything about mechanism of this partial reproductive mm. isolation. I've heard that several times before, so one assumes it's come from scientific um, uh, findings from somewhere. So... Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard that question uh, several times now, so it must have come from uh, perhaps a paper or a scientific paper. Yes, yes. So, uh, so there is research uh, about this in Europe, but there are also <laughs> some evidence from analysis of genetic material that uh, by analysis you can, uh, for example, see that Africanized bees are a little bit uh, isolated from those European ones. So, yes, there are some evidence more than our research. Uh, Twice I have united colonies, um, one colony quite dark, the other quite orange, distinctively, distinctively different. United over newspaper, on the second day, one subspecies, or one colour presumably, had been wiped out dead. Could this be another example of subspecies not wishing to tolerate each other, even if, uh, even if drones and queens mate? No, so this is, uh, <coughs> I, I believe, more related to nest mate recognition. So we know that bees from one colony recognize bees from other colony. 
and um, when there is, especially when there is not a lot of brood, they the guards will not allow no other bees to enter, and uh, this is protection against robbing. So when you use newspaper to unite colonies, um, you should. Um, I heard that some beekeepers use some sugar syrup with some uh, strong flavor to spray the both colonies and then the um, smell makes the aggression less likely. But I think when uh, you have like two strong colonies, when you unite them, they will fight and the stronger one will kill the other one. So I, I don't think it's related to subspecies and it's uh, completely unnatural situation which never occurs in nature. So it's unlikely that there is any biological explanation. I think this is just nest made recognition, recognition of bees from other colonies and defending against them. Uh, <clears throat> this one is typical of a question that we, um, we're always getting from uh, beginners. Uh, I have one beehive and plan to expand. The only option available is for me, uh, for me is either to buy the new uh, mated queen from Italy or a mated queen with six frame. Which one do you suggest? So if um, the beekeeper, as I understand, he has or he or she has already one hive, one colony. Yeah. So the one uh, colony should be uh, divided. You know. So um, when uh, so I would advise this beekeeper uh, to produce next summer two colonies from this one, and in another year another. So this way he will grow, and this is good idea because it's like slow increase. So. Um, so I think the beekeeper should learn how to produce this uh, nuke. Uh, I don't know how to yes, call it yeah, in English. Yeah, that's okay, yeah. Yeah, so I would advise next summer to produce two colonies and after two years, even more. So to increase the number of colonies this way. I'm glad you said, it, said that because it's, it is a problem in this country because uh, beginners aren't often taught. They're, they're taught to get a second colony, but not how. Um, and for the um, uh, for the question, uh, and and everybody else too, we're going to have a webinar specifically on that um, in the, um, the in the um, probably about March. So uh, keep your eyes open for it. Um, are drawings and dimensions for the bee box available? So the bee box that you showed, have you got drawings on your website? It's not yet, but I will put on uh, my website today or tomorrow. I will try to explain it a little more and give dimension. There is scale. So, yes, you can use it. And there is, yeah, I will try to explain because it's better if it's opened, if you can open it to clean it. Because, for example, in Poland, beekeepers are afraid that this, those feral colonies will spread diseases especially American fall brood. So uh, in, in Poland, uh, I advise those people who put the bird boxes to inspect and if colony is not surviving after colony died, I advise to clean inside to yeah, reduce as much as possible. But I think it's um, the risk of spreading diseases. <coughs> Although in Poland, the beekeepers are very afraid of this. There was research that uh, it's quite similar amount of those diseases in feral population and in managed one. And there was one study in UK. So I think it's important that the bee box can be opened in order to clean it. Uh, the thing about um, uh, diseases, I personally, I don't buy that one because I've removed several hundred colonies from wild situations. And in my opinion, they're much healthier than managed colonies. If they weren't healthy, they would just die out very quickly. And in apiary, they spread the <coughs> disease are spread very quickly. But the, the feral, they are single in one place. They, they have very little contact with others. So uh, yes, uh, I, I would expect that they are more healthy than yeah. <coughs> first colonies. 
Next one. What's the evidence that Varroa, or presumably the viruses, become less virulent in feral colonies? Seeley studies suggest behavioural changes by the bees help avoid Varroa by frequent swarming. Yes, I know. So it's a little bit of my speculation. So there was only one study, in fact, which was trying to explain if there is less virulence of Varroa. And this study was not really conclusive. So the conclusion is that it's not, but the data are not provided. And since then, I don't know any good research which is uh, verifying this. But why I think it's uh, possible or, or likely. For example, when you transport like Russian bees to United States, so they, they are not resistant any longer. So I think it's important to, to keep such a colony isolated. So it's not <clears throat> uh, invaded by Varroa from another colony. And uh, even when you take re resistant bees from Russia or from other place and move to another environment, so it's invaded by the more virulent <coughs> Varroa. But this is just my speculation. There is no research, unfortunately, but I think there should be, because also in theory, as I have mentioned, it should be expected that Varroa should not kill colonies when they are not treated because it's it's suicidal strategy. It's like COVID. The COVID virus is so successful in spreading because he's causing death only in small percentage of population. Most people are without symptoms or survive. And those other viruses related to COVID, which were much more virulent, which were killing people, they never spread because it was easier to, to confine, the, to find the, the people and and you know, reduce the spread. So, but there's no, no good evidence, yes. Does the Varroa resistance in feral bee colonies might be better uh, due to the presence of pseudoscorpions rather than a natural resistance to Varroa? So I, I, I don't know. So there are many uh, suggestions. Uh, I know that there are some beneficial organisms which live in feral colonies, uh, but uh, I, yes, I, I, I don't know. So there are many suggestions, including uh, size of cells, but uh, I, I don't know. Do feral colonies have smaller or larger brood comb size that will be uh, overall, uh, or bigger or smaller comb for stores? Yeah, so uh, you probably, Roger, know more about this than me uh, because I, in fact, I never removed feral colonies. <laughs> so I don't have any experience with this. I think that the bee, from like uh, publications, honeybees tend to fill the cavity. If there is large cavity, it will be filled completely. And if it's small, it will be small. So I think that the amount of brood and in general size of the colony will depend on the cavity. But uh, so, and also feral colonies will depend on the subspecies. So Ligustica feral colony will be different than Melifera feral colony. Um, I've only got experience in the south of England, um, but I, I think I would agree with you. Um, of course, I, I'm only aware of um, cavities of the size that we've got locally. I know Tom Seeley's done work, and Tom himself has spoken about this. His cavities seem to be about 50% larger than ours do, presumably because of the, uh, the, the bigger trees. So it's really just a case of what's available, um, what, what, what suits the bees that go in there. Um, this is actually quite an interesting one, bearing in mind what you've previously said about um, uh, varroa tolerance in uh, uh, Apis mellifera mellifera. Uh, somebody's asked a question, is anybody actually testing um, for AMM to see if the varroa tolerance is any better? Uh, so, yeah. 
So the question is if there are any tests, if varro, if uh, Mellifera is uh, tolerating varroa better than other subspecies. So um, as I, uh, I think that uh, I don't know about uh, such tests. So there are, there's lots of tests trying uh, to find resistance of honeybees to varroa, but um, I don't, uh, yeah, so there, are, there is an attempt in uh, Scandinavia, I think in Gotland, so this is Mellifera, but um, I don't think there is comparison between subspecies, but I, I, I'm not really, to be honest, I'm not expert in Varroa. Uh, this is a practical one. How can the brood cycle be interrupted to reduce Varroa? So uh, you can uh, remove queen or you can confine queen on uh, uh, like one frame and uh, for some time and then remove this, uh, uh, this brood. So by confining queen, you can produce such a situation that at some, for some time there will be no brood at all. Or the easiest is to remove the queen. So after removal of the queen, there will be time when there is no brood. And during this time, you can produce uh, some, you can split colonies and you can uh, treat against Varroa. And so you can combine this with other beekeeping strategies. Yeah. I know I'm, I, I'm butting in, in here, but um, if you take a queen away from a colony and create a, a brood break, when you get to, when you know there's a, a nectar flow on the way, it can rapidly increase the amount of honey that to, that a colony will store, and uh, this is a trick that the old beekeepers used to do. So it's, it's not quite the same thing, but there are things you can do with um, uh, with simple management techniques, and um, presumably a varroa control is one of them. Um, it is known the percentage of known beekeepers that keep AMM. Uh, is it is it known the percentage of known beekeepers that keep AMM in each part of Europe, uh, and is it rising? Um, this is obviously um, uh, going to be quite a difficult uh, question to to uh, 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 to answer. But um, there are certainly more organisations than there were, and they're getting much stronger. So presumably that will give you a clue. So, so the percentage of beekeepers can be also only estimated from some research. So there are some research in Great Britain, but this is based on a relatively small number of colonies. So from this, you can only estimate that in Scotland, there is more pure mellifera mellifera than in England, but it's not known. And in fact, most beekeepers don't know what subspecies they have. And there is a strange situation, at least in Poland. In Poland, most beekeepers, they don't like mellifera mellifera because there is like a information that they are more defensive, that they are not suitable. And uh, uh, it's strange, but people uh, try to avoid mellifera mellifera. So when we did the research in the apiaries, we found that beekeeper who is claiming my bees are carnica, when we investigated them, half of them were mellifera. And he was glad with them. So when beekeeper does not know that it's mellifera, he will like the bees. So, so the problem is it's a very little studied and um, it's not very, uh, not a lot of scientists is doing this kind of research. And the beekeepers should do this. And in this case, it can be done on larger scales. But unfortunately, not a lot of bees, uh, beekeepers are interested. And also, you need to learn this uh, using this morphometry. So what I'm trying to do is provide the software, the tools to do this. But largely, it's not, it's not known. And in Poland, we did some research. So we have collected bees not from beekeepers, but from flowers, from uh, 
south to north. So we know uh, more or less uh, about Poland that in north Poland, there is quite a lot of mellifera, some of them relatively pure, but farther south, it's more and more uh, carnica-like. And it's not quite clear if it's natural, because south of Poland, in uh, Slovakia, Hungary, there is already um, uh, carnica. So it's, it's very little known about the subspecies distribution. So that's, I think, I, I think that um, beekeepers should know more about this and especially hobby beekeepers. There is hope that they will be engaged. They will try to determine what's native and what's not and try to preserve it. But as I said, even if you don't want to make morphometry, and even if you don't know if it's mellifera, it's good to, to use local bees. So not buy anything from outside of your, of your Area. town or yeah. village. Okay. Um, is there evidence that virgin queens placed in small mating hives, such as apodeas, prior to mating are not as good after mating as those placed in mating hives that, that have more workers to look after them prior to mating? So I don't know. And in fact, it's clearly like beekeeping questions. And to be honest, I'm more biologist than a beekeeper. So uh, yes, it's, uh, it's possible uh, that there are some differences. But uh, I think that the quality of queens is, first of all, determined during development. So if you have like fewer number of queen cells, it's like swarming cells, I would expect they are better because they are better fed. And also um, the quality will be later determined by, you know, by the storage. But um, in terms of um, mating nuclei, so it can be, yeah, so this can affect only the mating, so amount of spermatozoa, but I, I don't know. I don't know if it's relevant or not, but so, well, many years ago now, there were things called micro nukes which were introduced, um, and it was no more than research. And um, they were about a quarter of the size of apodeas, and they were found to be absolutely useless because they just um, you just didn't get the temperature warm enough to get the um, sperm to migrate into the spermatheca. So I would, if I would be a beekeeper, especially a small scale beekeeper, I would try to keep as close to the natural situation <laughs> as possible. And in this case, like a very small colony is not, not natural. So there is problem with robbing, even wasps can be problem with such a small hive. So uh, I think if somebody is like small scale beekeeper, uh, it should uh, inseminate from colony, not from mating nuclei, because this is like a problem of a breeder. And I, I'm not really a breeder. You should ask the experienced breeder and uh, hopefully he will know and he will advise you how to better breed bees. I'm not really a breeder. Yeah. Uh, this one was re really just a statement, but it's from somebody else like me who's um, got quite a bit of experience of um, wild colonies. The wild colonies we are finding here um, are using 4.9 millimeter cell size and drawing fresh brew comb at that size. Um, it's really just a statement, I think, but um, uh, uh, would you like to comment on it? So when you, uh, so this is a known situation that the foundation used uh, in Europe is different than uh, natural size of cells. So when you allow bees to build their own cells, they are smaller than the most foundation used by beekeepers. Uh, how important is this? I don't know what I heard. There was some research if there is a relation between cell size and varroa and um, uh, it's not clear and probably it's not very important. So I, I know that uh, feral colonies will build smaller cells and maybe they are more suitable 
to them because also the size of the workers will be different when you use smaller cells. But I don't know how important is this. Uh, and this one we, 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 we've, we're we actually working on at the moment, but it's an interesting idea. Like a climatic classification of plants, especially in the USA, would it be beneficial in identifying uh, areas of local conditions so that bees raised in one area can be distributed within other areas, thereby improving their survival chances? <clears throat> yeah, so possibly. So for example, if you import bees from a similar climate, it's uh, possibly they will survive better. But this is, uh, from my point of view of conservation, it's uh, not good. I think it's better to use your local bees. They are the best for the local climate. But obviously, if you have choice between <laughs> importing Carnica and uh, some African subspecies, I would choose Carnica, you know, because the African subspecies, they are completely different uh, in behavior and, uh, and uh, unfortunately, backfast bees, they have some uh, admixture of uh, African genes. And for example, in Poland, we detect about 3% of African genes, which is not good, really. So, so in I would say it's not a good idea to import any bees, but if you have to, you should try to import from similar climate. But I think that's, uh, so beekeepers try to complicate things. So, but especially if you are like small scale beekeeper, if you have five hives, I think it's better not to complicate, just um, try to follow the natural cycle of local bees. My well, suspicion is that the, um, uh, the, the questioner was thinking about um, within this country. So perhaps if there was a similar area 100, 150 miles away, um, it, uh, that's in a similar area, they would, um, uh, they would know whether they, the bees suited their area. Yet if it was perhaps mountainous or uh, or coastal or, or, or something like that, it, it wouldn't. So I guess that's what it is. I'll just take two more. Um, uh, one has asked, uh, what is the web address of your website? So if you like, what we do is we'll, um, we'll send that round to all the, um, uh, all the, um, uh, all the listeners. And I'll take the very last one. Um, Adam mentioned that beekeepers had fewer colonies in UK than Poland. What is the average number of colonies that beekeepers in Poland have? Oh, unfortunately, I have closed this uh, publication. There is one uh, which is describing uh, many different countries. I don't remember the exact number, but I, uh, it, there is also lots of um, like hobby beekeepers. But my impression is it's, it's bigger. Unfortunately, I can't, I don't remember the numbers very well, but I, uh, if you are interested, I can also um, check in this publication. So it's, I have the uh, impression that in Poland, the beekeeping is more of commercial value. So even if beekeeper is like a hobby, this income is uh, more important to him. And usually there can be like 20 colonies, and uh, from this, you can produce some honey, which you sell. But um, yes, from like... Um, well, here's a, here's, a, here's a bit of a challenge. How about, how about you finding out and telling us next week? Is, sorry, sorry. How about you uh, finding out and telling us next week? Mm, I, sorry, but... Uh, have, you, have you got no official figures? Ah, okay. So the next week I, I will provide the figures. Yes. Okay. okay. And okay. actually, actually going back to the last question, uh, your, um, uh, the address of your website, perhaps you'll put that up next week as well. So okay. will you do that, Adam? Yes, yeah, I, thank I, you. I will try to um, provide the images about the B box and try to explain <coughs> how it can be mounted. And so this is kind of my idea about this. Maybe you will adopt it. 
Brilliant stuff, Adam. Thanks very much for a wonderful lecture. And I can confirm that your English is better than mine. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, on behalf of all the listeners, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I know that you, you're an hour uh, ahead of us, so you must be getting fairly close to your bedtime. Uh, so um, uh, have a drink on us um, uh, before you go to bed. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next week. And thank you, everybody else, for listening. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye-bye.